Let's go to the Lord in prayer once more. Our Father, we thank you again for your word and pray that you'd give us clarity of mind now and hearts bent on obeying you as we hear from you. Father, help us to understand again so that we may obey. Thank you for how you use your word so powerfully in the lives of men, women, and children today. We've heard that uh, from Brother Holly as we think about how your word impacts lives. We think that we, we pray that your word would impact lives here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If somebody says kids meal to you, what specific foods come to mind? I'm sure there would be a few that would come to mind, right? You think about, especially those of you who have kids or have had kids. Obviously, it depends to some degree on the restaurant, but I've noticed uh, as a parent of four boys that there's some common items that come up uh, as you go from place to place. Some of those would be pizza, of course, uh, grilled cheese, hot dogs, cheeseburgers, uh, along with that ever-present kid pleaser, the chicken nugget. Now, given their popularity and their wide availability today, it seems crazy to think that chicken nuggets have really only been around for a few decades. Technically, they were invented in 1963 by a Cornell University professor named Robert Baker, who was experimenting with various ways to increase the public's consumption of chicken and eggs. Actually, what he was doing was trying to help poultry farmers uh, open up new markets for uh, their product. And so among his creations, which included things like chicken hot dogs and chicken meatloaf, was this, this new uh, product, a novel product that consisted of processed chicken and a breaded coating. And he called it the chicken stick. Now, his chicken sticks didn't really catch on with the general public. They did some marketing trials. They did okay, but nobody really latched onto it in the corporate world. And so apparently, independently, McDonald's researchers devoted time and energy in the late 1970s uh, to come up with a similar product called the Chicken McNugget. Uh, and they were doing that in order to, to combat declining burger sales. And so I guess there was some bad press on red meat, and so they were looking for other ways to, uh, to increase the bottom line. And so they introduced their famous Chicken McNuggets in 1980, and the rest is history. Of course, their competitors followed suit, and now you can pretty much get chicken nuggets everywhere. Uh, the grocery store, where, wherever you go, there's chicken nuggets. But despite their popularity, uh, chicken nuggets have caused significant concern for many folks uh, because of some, some problems there. And so chicken nuggets have been linked to things like uh, childhood obesity, uh, which can lead to a whole host of other problems. And then I've also seen some articles in recent days uh, that question the actual chicken content in, in chicken nuggets. Uh, apparently there's a lot of additives in these things, and, and that's a little concerning. And then there's also the issue of a child's developing uh, eating patterns and, and taste. And so kids get accustomed to eating things that are, are less healthy, uh, like chicken nuggets, rather than things that are better for them, like fruits and vegetables or better quality meats. Uh, and so over an extended period of time, of course, that can also lead to health concerns. But as a parent, I can say I understand why chicken nuggets are so popular. One, they're quick, they're easy, they're relatively inexpensive, they taste halfway decent, and kids love them. And so they seem like they win on just about all accounts. But just because they're convenient... And because kids like them does not mean that that's something that we should build our diet upon. As a pastor, I've observed another problematic nugget phenomenon, if you will, in local churches. Uh, many Christians, perhaps most, tend to study the Bible in kind of bite-sized nuggets, quick, tasty little bite-sized chunks, if they read the scriptures at all. And this is, this is very consistent, of course, with how we take information in in a digital age. So we get a snippet of information here, a video clip here, a sound bite there, and we're just getting little bits and pieces of things. And just like a steady diet of chicken nuggets is less than healthy, consuming the scriptures in these tasty little bite-sized pieces can also lead to some significant problems, but on a spiritual level. So for instance, people are often left with all sorts of dots, but they lack the ability to connect the dots. 
And so I've seen and observed this over the, the years. Even some people who are in vocational ministry seem to lack the ability to connect the dots. And so they have little snippets here, snippets there, but they can't connect the dots and see the big picture. In other words, they can't synthesize biblical concepts well, and they're not able to do what we would call systematic theology because they've been conditioned to think in small, disconnected little snippets. And when it comes to approaching individual texts within the Bible, uh, this, this nugget methodology can often lead to misinterpretation. Now, those of you who are here for our Sunday night series uh, uh, living in Howard Hendricks' book, Living by the Book, will recognize uh, the, the issue there. Because a failure to devote substantial time and attention in observing the Scriptures, particularly their context, can lead to misinterpretation, which then will lead us to misapplication. And so we botch one thing. We don't take the time to see things in their context. And in that botch is how we interpret it, and that botch is how we apply it, which, in, which is not good, of course. So how do we address this nugget issue within the church, right? I mean, we can, in, in public health circles, they say, watch out for chicken nuggets. How do we deal with this issue in the church? Well, one way is to preach series in books or in big chunks of books, so we can begin to see the bigger picture and not just the little details. It, it is important, of course, for us to look at details. I'm not knocking that. We do need to understand details in passages, but we also need to be able to take a bird's eye view because these things are in a context. And if we're not seeing the larger context, many times we're going to come to wrong conclusions. Now, my original intent today was to preach 1 Corinthians chapter 8, to this week and next week. But in my studies, I was challenged to consider chapter 8 as a part of a bigger picture. That includes chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and in the beginning, the first verse at least, of chapter 11. And so uh, in seeing that with kind of new eyes, I felt like it was important for us to look at the broader picture. So this morning we're going to look at an overview of those chapters before we dive into the details beginning next week. Now, after I looked at this in more detail, the, the, the overview, if you will, uh, the words of Jesus Christ kept coming to mind, which we would often call the Great Commandment. Some of you are familiar with the Great Commandment. I, I don't think that's an accident because in part, I believe what the Apostle Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians is informed by what people call the Great Commandment. Now, we see that in multiple places in the Gospels. We see that clearly in the book of Matthew, chapter 22. So in Matthew, chapter 22, uh, we have here the Great Commandment. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the Great Commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, now when we examine these chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, all the way through the beginning of chapter 11, we see these themes coming up over and over and over again. Uh, love God, love neighbor, and, it, and it's within the context of living in a pagan world. Now, I've shared this before. Uh, uh, Paul is addressing things that are particular in, at times with the, the Corinthians. They're living in a city uh, that is a, a largely pagan city. This is a predominantly Gentile church. In many ways, it's much like a first century version of Las Vegas or New Orleans. Uh, and so the folks in the church at Corinth had come to Christ. People were coming to Christ out of this openly pagan context. Uh, and so they would deal with issues like what do we do with eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. That was a real issue for them. Now, we ourselves in 21st century America increasingly find ourselves in an openly pagan society. And so these lessons are certainly pertinent to us today. So let's take a look at the broader context this morning. We'll dive into chapter 8 next week. Again, the two principles here are love God and love neighbor. And so we're going to consider those principles and how we see them in the larger passage. Principle one, simply this. We are to love God with the whole of our being. 
We are to love God with the whole of our being. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Paul's moving on to a new topic. He says, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, and he goes on from there. There's the previous chapter, uh, chapter 7 in the book, dealt with questions of marriage. And we remember that those, those uh, were, were based on a letter that the Corinthians had written to Paul. And so he comes to chapter 8, new topic. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, uh, and he moves on to this other topic. We don't know if those were also questions in the letter or if it's just something he heard. He's not very explicit about that. Uh, but as one commentator pointed out, it's unlikely that Paul wouldn't have spoken about this before with them. At some point, it seems like Paul would have talked about this issue of things sacrificed to idols with them before. Why? Because Acts chapter 18 tells us that the Apostle Paul spent 18 months with the Corinthians teaching them the word. And so he's in this openly pagan context with them for 18 months teaching them the scriptures. It's highly unlikely that this issue wouldn't have come up before. At some point, somebody would have said, hey, by the way, are we supposed to eat the stuff that gets sacrificed to idols or not? Seems like, yeah, that would have been a, a very important issue for them to discuss at some point. That, that, will, that will play into how we look at this text later, uh, and we'll talk about that in future weeks. But for now, I want you to notice in the first three verses of chapter 8 how Paul sets up a contrast between knowledge and love. Now, it's not that, read, let's read it together. Chapter 8, uh, verse 1, it says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we, ha we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant or puffs up, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And so he's not attacking knowledge in general. After all, God gave us brains, and he expects us to use them, right? And so, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, yes. And so we're supposed to use our, our minds for the Lord. Ignorance is not virtue. However, knowledge that is not tempered by love will lead to pride rather than edification. And so what he's essentially saying is, yeah, yeah, knowledge, you know, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge by itself, knowledge alone puffs up it makes us arrogant rather than knowledge that is tempered by love which then builds up and so he's again he's not attacking knowledge but knowledge must be tempered by love now the corinthians had a serious problem with this so we saw how the corinthians were dealing with the issue of pride and how that infected affected and infected their church life and so the first four chapters of the book were devoted to the topic of division. And what was driving the division was pride in the people in the church. They were lining up behind their favorite leaders, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and some even claimed I'm of Christ. And we talked about that uh, a few months ago. But the, the, the issue there was pride, right? Okay, so uh, I'm of Paul because I'm so smart that I was smart enough to figure out that Paul is the one that we should follow. However, you are of this inferior one, Apollos, or you're of Cephas. And so again, there's pride that's driving the division. The Corinthians thought that they were so smart, but in reality, they were not living for Christ as they should have been. We see that clearly in chapter 5. They failed to exercise discipline when one of their own was engaging in open, scandalous, ongoing, unrepentant sin. And they're, they're, they're tolerant of it, and their tolerance in part is driven by pride. We're so loving, we're so warm, we, we, we love so much that we're willing to tolerate and ignore this scandalous sin. And Paul says, no, actually, you're demonstrating a lack of love for the one who's sinning. Because actually, the better thing for him would be to cast him out so they would get his attention, and hopefully in the day of the Lord he'd be saved. And so again, this pride, this this supposed knowledge without being tempered by love is driving all sorts of problems in the church at Corinth. Again, it's, it's kind of ironic because they think that they're so smart and they think that they have all this knowledge and then the Apostle Paul is, is continually correcting them on everything. It's a little bit funny, isn't it? Almost uh, just reminds me of the old cartoon or whatever with that dog and they lift up the tail and just pop, 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 pop. It's like, come on, Corinthians, you, you, you think you're smart, but you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Something is wrong. 
And so Paul begins this section here in chapter 8, which stretches all the way through the end of chapter 10, beginning of of chapter 11, by emphasizing the need for love in the church. Now he's going to deal with that again later in the letter. Most of you have heard of the love chapter in Scripture, which is what? What's the love chapter? 1 Corinthians 13, right? And so we're going to see that theme come up again. Why does he address that so forcefully? Because that was a problem in the church at Corinth. They weren't being driven by love. But this love isn't just horizontal. It's not just person to person. In fact, this this vertical love, love for God, drives brotherly love. We see that clearly in the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, we see quite clearly that vertical love, in other words, love for God, being loved by God, is driving brotherly love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, We also ought to love one another. Verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And so Paul mentions love for God here in verse 3 back in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And he mentions that before he starts dealing with issues of love for neighbor. Why? Because genuine love for God drives brotherly love and so Paul links these just as John does and he talks he says there uh, in verse 3 but if anyone loves God he is known by him now he's not talking about the order in which things happened as John just said in the book of first John that God first loved us and then in response we love him but he's making a pertinent observation if anyone loves God that person is known by God those things are linked together This principle of love for God informs much of what we see in the next few chapters in the book. And that's really what I'm getting at. Everything's building up to this climax of chapter 10, verse 31. Chapter 10, verse 31, most of you have probably heard this verse quoted at some point before. It says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the to the glory of God. Now the part about eating or drinking refers to the specific topic of these, these uh, verses or these chapters. And that is eating uh, food sacrificed to idols or meat sacrificed to idols. We'll get to that in the weeks to come. But what's immediately clear in the verse, and this is how it's often quoted, is that the undergirding principle for any action in the Christian life should be a desire to see God glorified. And what drives that? Well, it's fueled by a love for God. This is entirely consistent with what we're seeing in the great commandment. Loving God with the whole of our being leads us to live for his glory. They're linked together. And so again, Paul says, look, everybody has knowledge. Knowledge without love puffs up, or knowledge without love puffs up, but love builds up or edifies. And then at the end, kind of as bookends in the whole section, He says, look, do everything for God's glory. And what drives that is love for God. And so anytime we see a theme coming up in the scriptures again and again, it's important. But especially when that theme is like the bookends. So you have a larger passage and you have a theme here and a theme here that tells you that probably you better pay attention to where that theme comes up in between because it matters. And so the bookends are important. But what about the stuff in between? Does it come up in the remainder of the chapters? And indeed it does. And this is how my understanding of chapter 8 was challenged as I studied this week. I'm going to try to explain this as briefly as possible. I didn't hear any amens, so that's probably a positive sign. People often cite 1 Corinthians 8. And if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians at all, you've probably done this or heard this. People often cite 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to discuss Christian liberty and its limits. Uh, And they apply lessons from the text to modern questions uh, that we face in our world. Like, is it appropriate for Christians to consume alcohol? Or what about our entertainment choices? And so on and so forth. While I do believe that there is some application there, 
uh, people often look at chapter 8 in isolation and assume that Paul's overall message is this. Well, it's really fine if you eat meat sacrificed to idols. It's really not that big of a deal. But for the sake of those who have weak consciences, uh, in other words, out of neighbor love, you should abstain from eating if that's going to be a stumbling block to someone else. That's what people often talk about with chapter 8. They say, well, it's really not a big deal but because there are some who have weak consciences, you should pay attention to your brother. And so the theme that people will cite is brotherly love. Now that is an application. It is a theme. But I would argue that this is a secondary theme. Because when you zoom out, when you look at chapters 8, 9, and 10 in their entirety, the question becomes, is that really what Paul's trying to say? Is that the message that Paul is trying to get across in these chapters, is he, telling him, is he telling the Corinthians that it's fine for them to eat me sacrificed to idols? Is that what he's telling them? Or is he warning them that their, their misapplied knowledge, the facts that they have that may indeed be right, but they're not strung together properly, and they're certainly not tempered by love, is he warning them that their misapplied knowledge, their pride, and their casual attitude towards idols are going to lead them down a road of temptation like the one that the Israelites traveled before them, which will ultimately end up in idolatry. And indeed, I think it's the latter. As you look at these chapters, upon further review, well, the instant replay, right? Upon further review, I believe that's the, the overall message. Paul's telling them that their love for God should cause them to flee idolatry, to get away from it, and devote themselves fully to the one true God. That is the overarching theme here. The Israelites, when we get to chapter 10 and we look at what happened to the Israelites, the Israelites had all manner of blessings showered upon them by the Lord. They had all these things going for them that were good and right. All those things were happening to the Israelites. And yet they toyed with idolatry. They toyed with idolatry. And what happened? The wrath of God was poured out on them. Because they toyed with idolatry. And they incurred God's wrath. We, saw, we see that in chapter 10. And so what Paul's saying is, look, learn from their example. Don't toy with idolatry. You're, you're, you're toying with this. Like, yeah, it's okay if we eat meat sacrificed to idols, right? And Paul's saying, you're not seeing the big picture. Look at those that came before you. Something really bad happened to them because they had a casual attitude towards idolatry. Learn from their mistakes, because if you toy with idolatry, you're going to end up being in a bad state yourself. And so learn from their example. Now, neighbor love, again, is a theme in the, the, in the larger section. And it does come up several times. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I would say it's secondary to love for God. That's really the overarching theme that's here. Now, at this point, some of you may be scratching your head. Where are you going with this, Pastor Kevin? This doesn't seem like what I've heard before on 1 Corinthians. And I'm not giving you a ton of detail at this point. I would say hang in there. Things will become clearer as we work through these chapters together. But it's important for us to try to see the big picture of what it is that Paul is actually trying to say here. I, I wanted to get this out front because this is going to drive what we see in the next few weeks. And so as we're working through this text, I'm going to come back to this a number of times to say, look, this is what the primary theme here is. And Paul is building this argument not to say, yeah, it's fine. It really doesn't matter whether you eat. That's what the Corinthians were thinking. But Paul's actually saying, no, learn from Israel's mistakes because they fell into a trap and you're about to fall into one too. Don't fall into the trap, guys. The, the, the Corinthians, what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, that they were to love God with all of their being. And that love should drive all of their decisions in life, including whether or not they choose to partake in meat that was sacrificed to idols. Because they are, li they are to be living for God's glory in every avenue, in every area of life. That should drive them. That should be the motivating, consuming passion of their lives. And my friends, this is where the rubber meets the road for us. The, the question is simple. Do we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's the question for us. Still applicable. In other words, are we loving God with the whole of our being? Are we following the casual pursuit of God as the Corinthians seem to have been in some ways? Now, any person with an ounce of 
of humility will acknowledge, no, I'm not. I, I fear for the person who would say, absolutely, I 100% love God with all of my being. I, I would argue, listen, you need to take a more realistic view of yourself, where you're at. That, that's scary almost. Well, not almost, it is scary. The, I, I fear, though, the problem is, even if you have an ounce of humility and you would, you would acknowledge that, yeah, I'm not loving God with all of my being as I should be, that the reality is that we're probably a lot further from that than we would want to acknowledge. We think in our own minds, yeah, you know, I'm not quite there, but I'm really close. And the reality is if we examine our lives, we see that, no, we're not as far along as we think we are, or certainly not as long, far along as we should be. Uh, please understand that when I say that, I'm saying we, because I'm certainly including myself in this indictment. And, and to be perfectly frank, I'm going to just throw this out there. This study in 1 Corinthians, particularly the last few weeks, has been somewhat depressing for me. Because I, I think what it's done is forced me to open my eyes at the, the, the reality of our spiritual condition as a church and certainly as of mine as your pastor and as an individual. To see that, you know, uh, where are we at? And, and by and large, I think if we're honest, we're much more like the Corinthians than we want to acknowledge. Uh, the similarities between the, the Corinthians and 21st century American Christians, and certainly even those of us here at Rikers Ridge, are, those similarities are, are stunning and, and, and depressing, to be honest with you. So what is the solution? Do we just mope around in a perpetual state of spiritual oppression and say, well, I'm just never going to be where I should be? Well, or do we resign ourselves to being worldly like the Corinthians? Do we just throw up our hands and say, look, I'm never going to be what I should be, and so therefore I'm going to quit striving? Or do we deny the truth and act like everything's okay? Oh, Pastor Kevin, you're just being too harsh, man. Why do you keep waking up on the wrong side of the bed? What's wrong with you? Is that the approach that we take? Or do we maybe even get angry with the pastor because you think I'm being too harsh? No, 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 no. No, that's not what we should do. So what are we supposed to do? If we recognize that our love for God is not what it should be, if our love for God is deficient, then how do we address the issue? Well, for some, for some, they may need to consider, some of us or some in, this, in our midst here may need to consider the possibility that you do not love God because you are not known by him at all. In other words, you're not his child. Now, that's harsh, but that's true and it's reality. In other words, you may have never actually been converted. And so there is a possibility for some, if, if the, 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 the grand scope of your life says, I don't love God, that should cause us to reflect on our own spiritual condition. If this is something you know, you're right, Pastor Kevin, I don't really love God. Well, then maybe you're not known by him. You've never passed from darkness to light. You've never turned away from your sin. You've never repented. You've never placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who can save you. If you've never done that, if, if, that's not, if you're not a genuine follower of Christ, then you must know that only the Lord can foster that deep and abiding love within you for him. Because when you are a follower of Christ, when you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in you, indwells you so that you will have that. That, that just bears fruit within your life. And so again, for some, maybe an honest look to say, yeah, I, I don't love God. And that's because I've never come to faith in him through Christ, his son. But for the majority here, you may say, you know, I do know God. Jesus has saved me. And yet, I recognize, if I'm honest, that my love for God is pitiful. Uh, we may say that. Well, certainly, if I'm honest, God is not the all-consuming priority of my life. Well, then what should we do? do? Do I just walk away and say, hey guys, good luck with that one. Hope you find a way to address this issue. That's, that's, that's pastoral malpractice to not give you something uh, to go off of. So what should you do? Well, first off, humble yourself and pray, right? Who, who can change our hearts? God can. So doesn't it make sense then if we find that we're deficient in our love for him, that we should humble ourselves before him and call out to him, plead, oh God, help me to love you more. That should be the heart cry. Humble ourselves. You, how are you ever going to get anywhere if you don't acknowledge that this is a problem? And the thing is, God already knows what's going on within us anyway, right? We can't hide from him. 
well, maybe God doesn't know that I don't really love him the way that I should. Yeah, right. He knows. I promise you, he knows. So humble ourselves before him. Prayer fosters a spirit of humility that is pleasing to God to say, God, forgive me for this hard, wretched heart that I have, and God, foster within me a greater love for you. What else can we do? Well, there's lots of things. Here's a question for you. Do you value the fellowship of other believers? In other words, is the church important to you? Consider the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, hardness of heart. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What is the solution? Encourage each other as followers of Christ so that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The, the, the bottom line is that we need each other. Right? God didn't leave you as an isolated believer alone in this world. Sometimes that can be discouraging, that can be depressing, we isolate ourselves, and this is telling us, don't be hardened by that. Enjoy the fellowship of the saints. I can't tell you, I cannot tell you how valuable in recent days the, 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 the friendship of some brothers in Christ has been to kind of pull me out of the, the, the whatever that I, I'm in when I'm thinking about these things and just getting down in the dumps. Just a simple time of encouragement with a fellow believer can pull you out of the gutter. Certainly it's happened to me many times in recent days. And of course, I, I would urge you to devote yourself more and more to the study of the scriptures. Uh, no question there. Approaching them with a teachable heart and an intent to obey. This isn't just for intellectual stimulation. If you wanted somebody to just provide you with intellectual stimulation from week to week, you got the wrong guy, right? That what we're here to do is to learn so that we might obey. That with a teachable heart, approaching the scriptures with a desire to learn so that I can be a more faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. That's why we study God's word. There's an end, right? Is there a goal to our instruction? Is there a goal to our instruction? What is it? It's love. In other words, we don't just study this stuff just so we can build a big head. Paul says that puffs you up. But when it's tempered by love, when knowledge is fueled by, tempered by love, it can be a powerful weapon in the hands of the Savior. And this is a good thing. And so this is a, a wonderful tool that God uses. Now, let me just acknowledge that sometimes... It's like a, a dog chasing its tail, right? I don't love God the way that I should be, therefore I don't really feel like being in the Word, and so therefore I don't study the Scriptures, which then in turn fuels my lack of love for God, and so on and so forth. And sometimes you got to break out of the whirlpool, right? And so it may be that you dive into the study of the Scriptures, and the first time that you open God's Word and dive into it, you don't have this riveting experience. But don't close your Bible and say, that didn't work for me. I, it just didn't work for me. My friends, patient, perseverance, regular, continual, getting into the word, praying, God, help me to understand this, that I might obey you more, step by step, perseverance. Don't operate based on just because, well, I just, I opened the Bible a couple times, I read it, it just didn't really, it's not a magic, it's not magic beans or something that you throw in the ground and all of a sudden this thing grows up, Right? Persevere in your study of God's word and God can use it for his glory. What else? Well, there's lots of other things we could say. In my own time and, and reading and studying, I've been incorporating in recent days or trying to uh, some reading of missionary biographies. In other words, what has God done in the lives of others and how can that stir us to greater faithfulness, especially in, in seeing other people or uh, uh, seeing other people come to faith in Christ. And so right now I'm reading uh, a biography of a early Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to Burma in the 19th century. Just amazing how in God's providence this man was brought to Christ and then he served God with his life. And those things stir us, right? They stir a passion within us to serve Jesus with our whole lives. We've got to move on. I wish we didn't, but we, we've got to move on. There's a lot more that we could say there. Let me just offer this. It's not in my notes, but if 
if, uh, if this is something that you're struggling with, then, then let's talk. Because I, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel the same way all the time. Uh, in fact, some ways, sometimes I feel like I don't want to do anything. But the reality is that God calls us to use our lives for him. And if we can edify one another and walk together arm in arm in this journey towards greater faithfulness towards Jesus Christ, and if God could use me to be a help, I would love to talk to you about that. I'm certainly not going to shame you. It would be hypocrisy. Principle number two in our text. We are to love our neighbors, both believers and unbelievers, as ourselves. We are to love our neighbors, both believers and unbelievers, as ourselves. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the sermon that uh, neighbor love certainly is present there. And I use the word neighbor because that includes both believers and unbelievers. We see that there in the text. Love for, love for believers, love for unbelievers at various points in these chapters. So how do we see this? In the larger context, well, certainly we see it in chapter 8, as I mentioned before. The, the Corinthian church was notoriously selfish. I mean, if you look at the root of a lot of their problems, it was based on selfishness. They were selfish people. And so Paul is telling them, you've got to consider the needs of others. Don't just look at your own issues. Don't just look at things from your perspective. You've got to consider the needs of others. In fact, Love for brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than any supposed or actual rights that you have. And that's certainly uh, the sentiment behind Paul's statement in verse 13 of chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Uh, is, is Paul saying, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm choosing to be a vegetarian? No, he's, he's offering something that's going way beyond what's even called for because he says, look, if what I'm doing in eating meat is causing a brother to stumble, I'll never eat it again. Why? Because he's more important than my satisfaction from eating meat. For some of us, swearing off meat would be really hard, right? We love meat. And Paul's saying, if I had to go to those lengths so that I wouldn't cause a brother to stumble, I would do it. Why? Because of neighbor love, love for others. He would rather give up meat altogether than cause a Christian brother to stumble or sin. And in the whole of chapter 9 describes how love for others motivated Paul to do everything that he could to win others to Christ. And we read those verses twice actually during the sermon. I think that was good because hopefully the point was reinforced there. Even if that meant that Paul needed to give up legitimate rights like taking support financial support for his ministry. He was willing to give that up. Uh, and his stance is best summarized in chapter 9, verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all. Why? So that I may win more. He did not want to do anything that would put unnecessary stumbling blocks in front of others. His love for others drove him even to give up his own rights. And then that sentiment is repeated at the end of chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. And so out of his love for unbelievers and his desire to see them come to know the hope of Christ... He was willing to give all sorts of things up. And this message comes out in a number of other places. We'll see that more in the weeks ahead. Now, the fact of the matter is that we live in an openly selfish society. I, I, maybe we don't realize it. Uh, the powers that be would prefer not to word things that way, perhaps. But we live in the midst of an openly selfish society. In fact, selfishness is at the philosophical foundation of much of what we do in 21st century America. We're always thinking about ourselves. How can I improve myself? How can I have more self-esteem, self-worth, self, 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 self? They even have magazines, websites, everything devoted to self. And what Paul's saying here is quit thinking about yourself. Think about others. Quit being so selfish. Quit thinking about all your needs and think about the needs of your brothers in Christ. Think about the needs of those who are not in Christ, unbelievers. Quit thinking about yourselves. Guys, if, you, if you're my age or younger, you've heard this from the time that you were this side. Oh, you're the most important person in the world. You're so important. You're this. And what this is saying is, no, God is important. And your brother is important. And those other people outside who don't know Christ, they're important. Not that we're not important, but that's certainly not the chief thing there. 
Love God. Love neighbor. That's the great commandment. We already love ourselves, and we do it too much. I, I told Melinda one time I wanted to write a book. I, I love myself too much already, or something like that. Right? I'm always looking out for my own best interests. Always. And yet here, Paul is saying, no, actually, quit thinking about yourselves. You're being selfish. You have this knowledge, yes, so it's just food or it's just idols. But actually, what you're going to do is cause a brother to stumble. And really, if I'm honest with you, you're going to fall into the same trap that the Israelites did before you. And you're going to stumble into idolatry, you foolish Corinthians. And when we're consumed by self, we're not seeing things like this. So if there's a challenge for us this morning, it's this. Let's stop thinking about ourselves so much and look out at others. Have you considered the needs of your brothers and sisters? In oh, man, I could go on. I've, I've got thoughts swirling in my head that wisdom is telling me, don't say that. Don't say that. How do we operate as a body? Do we think about the needs of others or are we only looking at our own selfish desires? Well, I wish it was this way. I wish it was that way. I wish we would do this. I wish we would do this. Instead of saying, what about the needs of the whole? What about the needs of others? What about the lost people that live right beside us who need Christ? Am I even thinking about that? Is my life consumed with a passion for the glory of God? That's where we need to be. That's what we're striving for. That's why I'm here. That we would strive together to live for God's glory. Whether you eat or drink, do all things for God's glory. That's what we should be consumed by. That's why I get so excited up here. That we would live for God's glory. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. There's a whole lot more we could say. This is a very challenging portion of scripture, of scripture and a good one. They're all good. It's all inspired. But certainly it's a, it's a, it's a heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching when we see ourselves in light of what Paul's presenting as the ideal. But the fact of the matter is there's hope. Because if God would, would deal with this broken, messed up first century church and say, Okay, patiently, I'm going to persevere with you, and I'm going to point you in a better direction. If God was willing to do that then, he's willing to do that with us now. God's not done with us. There's hope for this body of believers. I believe that with all my heart. And I'm so excited to be a part of what God is doing here. Do you know what's even better news? The fact of the matter is, we're not saved by the measure of our own love for God, right? We're not saved by that. Because if we were, we're all doomed. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a sacrifice for us. We're going to always fall short. But there's one who did not fall short. And it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that, my friends, is gospel. That is good news. Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? To save sinners. Jesus Christ did not fall short. And yet Jesus Christ did what? He gave himself for sinners just like us. People who will continually fall short. People who will always not measure up. But Jesus measured up. And God loved us enough to send Jesus to die in our place. To take the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And then Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again. So we have a living hope, living Savior. And there's hope for us today. If you've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would love to talk and pray with you about that today. And, and let me just encourage you, my friends. If you're under conviction this morning about some of the things that we've talked about, don't just push that aside, right? Don't, don't leave here and just go get some lunch, and then you're thinking about whatever else is going on. Come back to this. Read it again for yourselves. Dwell on it. Let it bother you. Let it give you insomnia for a little bit. That's okay. If it will cause you to reflect on why you're here and to commit yourself more fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you uh, for the work that you're doing in our midst. Lord, I thank you for this church family. God, we acknowledge uh, 
that we are totally unworthy of your love. But Jesus, Jesus did not fall short. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your compassion, your mercy, your love for us. And God, I pray that you give us a greater joy in our hearts when we see the wonder of the gospel, how you saved sinners and how you still continue to use redeemed sinners to carry out your plans in this world. Lord, thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing in this world. Help us to be more faithful in this. Stir our souls, Lord, that we might live as consistent, growing disciples of Jesus. And Father, uh, we pray this morning for those who are in our midst, who, who are outside of Christ, who maybe are unsettled by this message because they recognize that they don't know you. God, would you patiently guide them uh, in your word, in your truth, and Lord, would you save them? We pray that. Father, use us for your glory, uh, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be down uh, here at the front in just a moment. If, if, uh, if you're outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you, you, you see your own uh, hopelessness outside of Christ, would love to talk and pray with you about that. If you're looking for a church home, would love to talk and pray with you about that as well.